Hello, everyone. Welcome to our online video series, Reading Hope in Trying Times. Our guest today is Shane Claiborne. Shane's a prominent speaker, activist, and best-selling author. He worked with Mother Teresa in Calcutta and founded The Simple Way in Philadelphia. He heads up Red Letter Christians, a movement of folks who are committed to living as if Jesus meant the things he said. What a concept, right? Uh, Shane is a champion for grace, which led him to jail advocating for the homeless and to places like Iraq and Afghanistan to stand against the war. Now Grace fuels his passion to end the death penalty and to help stop gun violence. Shane's books include Jesus for President, Red, Level Re Red Letter Rev Revolution, Common Prayer, Becoming the Answer to Our Prayers, his classic The Irresistible Revolution, and his newest book, Beating Guns. He's been featured in a number of films, including Another World is Possible and Ordinary Radicals. Shane speaks over 100 times per year, nationally and internationally, and his work has appeared on Esquire, Spin, Christianity Today, Time, The Wall Street Journal, and he's been on everything from Fox News and Al Jazeera to CNN and NPR. There's a breath for you. He's given academic lectures at Harvard, Princeton, Liberty, Duke, and Notre Dame and also speaks regularly at denominational gatherings, festivals, and conferences around the globe. So Shane, we're really glad to have you with us here today. Yeah, glad to be talking with you. And I'm thrilled to be, a, we believe in compassionate Christianity, you know, so I'm excited to have the conversation and by all the wonderful people you're bringing together, brother, it's great to be here. Well, thank you. It's certainly my pleasure and privilege and very blessed to have people like you involved in this. Yeah. So um, maybe we can start just by, you know, if you'd like to share your thoughts on the health crisis and, you know, what you feel is uh, important for us right now. Oh, wow. Well, I, 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 you know, I'm, we're recording this. I'm in Philadelphia looking across the street at the community we started uh, 20, over 22 years ago, 23 years ago. And um, uh, we're, we're just sort of trying to be both uh, courageous and cautious, you know, to use wisdom, but not be so driven by fear that we're not, you know, attentive to our neighbors and stuff. So um, we heard that about a hundred different agencies have closed down in Philadelphia that share food with folks that are vulnerable or homeless. And um, so we've kind of kept that going. In fact, we've ramped it up. So uh, it's, it's incredible for me to just be a part of a neighborhood that's trying to uh, be present with each other, and we have a lot of folks that live on the street, so we're, we're certainly um, um, trying to figure out, you know, how do we care for folks that are, you know, don't have a place to quarantine, you know, they don't have a place to, to hunker down in, um, and, and other, you know, vulnerable people, like uh, we've got a recovery community we're connected to, and they really rely on face-to-face -face group meetings, you know, um, 12 steps and things, so there's there's a lot of uh, folks, our friends in prison, many of whom can't get visitors at all right now, um, folks that are victims of domestic violence that, you know, being locked in can be, you know, really dangerous and create anxiety and fear. So, um, yeah, no, 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 like magic anecdotes, but I think it, there's a lot of creativity happening in all of it. There's, uh, I just heard about neighborhood hubs, you know, there are these neighborhood pods that are just sitting out and being present with each other. I love those viral videos, the Italians singing songs to each other, you know, and um, so I, I think there's the spirits moving in the midst of it all. Um, I just got word that executions are indefinitely postponed. So, you know, folks can't have their normal process of appeals and going to court, meeting with lawyers. So we'll probably hit the lowest executions that we've had in, in modern history. So that's, Yay. Uh, you know, uh, yeah, it's crazy, right? Like, I, I just think like the, 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 the good and the bad's always sort of intertwined. And so I think what this coronavirus, uh, the COVID-19 thing is doing is really, uh, you know, exposing who we really are, holding a mirror up to us. And I think it, it, it'll pull the worst fears out of some people and the deepest compassion from others. So, uh, you know, I think we just got to stay grounded and um, and, 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 you know, be as present with neighbors as we can be. I know personally in my business background, that was one thing I was really struck with when I was younger was how a crisis situation really does bring out the true colors. 
Yeah, I, I mean, you sure don't want to wait for a crisis, but <laughs> in, in some, some ways, you know, living in a neighborhood where people have uh, been the brunt of injustice in a lot of different iterations, um, I mean, I've learned a lot about resilience and faith and hope from the neighborhood I live in. I, I can remember some years ago when the, mock, the stock market was kind of flailing, one of my neighbors goes, well, God's good. We got each other. We're going to make it through it. And he goes, and my people have been in a recession for a few hundred years, you know, and, and God, God will be with us. So exactly. Sort of that, you know, kind of uh, this too shall pass, but you know, no matter how bad it gets, uh, got, we, we got each other. I was um, doing an interview earlier today with another woman that's um, heavily involved in the homeless community in Charlotte, North Carolina. And um, she was, mentioning the same things that you are that you know the vulnerable are even more vulnerable in these times yeah absolutely and and um so I, I think there's a lot of folks that are uh you know doing uh really wonderful work that we need to be supporting and i, I mean even things that you know we sort of take for granted like meals on wheels and those groups that are just out there doing good all the time we need to see if there's ways that those of us that are able to take a, a few risks, you know, might be able to be uh, more present than we, we might normally be uh, with, with those groups that are out there doing it. So grateful for, you know, all the healthcare workers and others that are showing up and, um, and, and taking care of people. So yeah, it's, it's a, a beautiful time for compassion. And if we believe light shines in darkness, uh, it's a great time to shine. I hear you. I hear you. So um, you've, you know, been through a lot of different experiences in your life and uh, you know what have you learned that you can share with folks about you know how to deal with tough times well I, I, I do know that I felt like the, the I, I felt the spirit of God in moments of pretty deep desperation and in my own life some of that uh, I mean I, I, I know when we were in Iraq, I was in, in um, Baghdad with the Iraq peace team and Voices in the Wilderness, Christian peacemaker teams. A bunch of us went there in 2003 to um, be a physical presence standing against the war and uh, volunteering in the hospitals in Baghdad during the bombing. And we ended up being there during, you know, the shock and awe campaign when uh, 900 or more bombs a day were being dropped on Iraq. Um, so it was horrific and it was absolutely total chaos, you know, um, and, and most of the chaos was coming from our own government and coalition troops, you know, just uh, things that I will never forget. Um, but in the midst of that, uh, probably the scariest time of my life, um, I mean, I kind of keep thinking back on that because this is another one of those liminal spaces where it's just like, man, it's pretty scary for a lot of folks, you know, and I think in that, in that moment, there's one memory I have in particular where we were throwing a birthday party for a 13-year-old in the middle of this war. And, um, you know, you thought, she's turning 13. we got to have a birthday party. You know, so we threw this birthday party. We're playing games, blew up balloons, had a birthday cake, the whole deal, you know. And then the bombs started falling. And all the adults were like, all right, you know, we better get inside. And uh, the, kids, the kids just looked at us. And they said, no we got to keep the party going. And then one, you know, smacked me in the head with a balloon. And we, we, we literally did, we kept this, you know, party rolling. And, um, and I, I, we were asking them all, uh, that was the young girl's name. She turned 13. We said, what do you want for your birthday? And she said, I just want peace. I want the bombs to stop. And then she thought for a minute, just like a 13 year old. And she goes, but if one night while everybody was out of my high school, if, one of the bombs hit it. That would be awesome because we would have to go to school for a long time, you know. And uh, <laughs> but, you know, I just think there's that there's sort of a youthful innocence that we need, and sort of I can remember the bomb, you know, the the airplanes flying over, and these kids would yell, "Salam, salam, lahar, no war, no war, peace," you know. And it was like they believed that the pilots of these these airplanes could hear them, you know. And 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 there's, there's just sort of that. I, I think that over and over was a lesson that I learned, you know, that we just, we, we, we've got to have that resilient hope. I think this is a unique situation, you know, where we also need to have some 
wisdom and precautions to protect folks that are vulnerable in the coronavirus. But I also think that there are there's space for um, the spirit to move in all of this. And to I also like some of the my 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 most meaningful interactions with what I would call like the supernatural or the the uh, miraculous were when we were in Iraq. You know, I mean, we when when one night when the bombs started falling, we went we had a prayer meeting. And there was this windstorm that whipped up and it whipped all this, you know, orange sand from the desert up. And then the, the, it started raining. And um, so as we're going into this prayer meeting, the rain as it came down was gathering the dust from the, the desert and it was dripping on our shirts. And it literally looked like the heavens were bleeding, you know, uh, like it, it was on our shirts. And we walked into this meeting just incredibly moved by um, what was happening around us, but also it felt like we were in this sphere where we were totally re relying on God. And um, that's a place that not, not a lot of us get, you know, I think we we're used to, you get hungry, you go to the store, you get sick, you go to the hospital, but a lot of the world has leaned heavily on um, sort of the miraculous uh, um, hand of God in the universe. And so I, I think it's, you know, one of those times, even as, as we were leaving Iraq, we had a, a car accident. It was a bad car accident. Our car flipped over. And um, and yet, you know, these Iraqi, these Iraqi men saved our lives. And these doctors took care of two of my friends that were injured really badly. And like in, in all of that, it was just one, one act of compassion and resilient hope uh, after another. So... Um, you know, I, I really believe that, um, you know, in moments like these, we can, we can feel a sensitivity to God that, that um, is, is pretty extraordinary. And we can also feel, I think, an opportunity to, to be present with neighbors in a way that we, we might not be attentive to usually. You know, we kind of get used to our daily routines and um, it's hard to have a routine right now. So it might make space for some holy interruptions. Well, I think that's such a great way to look at it. You know, um, you've been through some experiences that are not, you know, normal under, <laughs> you know, kind of a, an American um, version of that term. And uh, as you said, you know, um, they've been incredibly meaningful for you. And now here we're all in some semblance of not normal, um, not, not nearly to the extent that you are, but uh, it certainly is an opportunity, I think, to, to get closer to God, to really think a little bit more about our faith and um and what we need to do um yeah it's probably a lot of thinking about you know what's important in our life what do we need what do we not need what's the clutter that you know we we kind of the things that we hide behind and the screens that we you know we hide behind like there's i think there's a real uh opportunity to rethink our rhythms and our values and priorities and um i don't know i, I know for me i've i've it's been very good for uh, my exercise life and for our prayer life for my wife and I, like we're, we're just able, I, I travel so much, you know, and have a real irregular routine of, you know, so this has been kind of wild. We've, we've actually been waking up and having some rhythms, reading the scripture. And I, sometimes exercise and prayer feel, feel kind of similar to me. They, they're, they're not always things that I'm excited to do, but as I do them, I kind of feel myself becoming healthier you know and so i've been trying to run you know i've been uh so we're we're um yeah we're we're making the most of it and i was talking to my friend jonathan wilson hartgrove uh last night we were uh texting each other back and forth and saying like the monastic tradition has a lot to offer us right now when it comes to wisdom because the, they they're very familiar with a quarantined uh life you know and um of solitude and prayer and so you know, and, and, and fighting their own inner demons and stuff too. So it's a, it's a great time, I think, to do some soul checking and, and also still to realize that there's a lot of people that don't have that privilege. You know, there's folks that this is just chaos for them because they're, you know, on the streets or, or in other vulnerable situations. So I think we can do both, you know. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. I just had the monastic um, conversation with Kathleen Norris. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. So she was saying the same thing that you were. <laughs> 
Yeah, well, one of my mentors is a. She's right at ninety years old now, and she she uh she's taught me a, a ton about that. You know, in, in some of our language around new monasticism, she's kind of been a part of those conversations for twenty years. Because we when we were starting our community, some of these older, more classic monastic, uh, you know, uh, nuns and um, priests came alongside of us. And they said, you know, we love what the spirit's doing, something fresh and new. This community, but some of us, you know. We've been doing this for a while, you know, and one of them goes, our community's been around for 1,600 years, so we, we've got a few nuggets of wisdom to offer here and there. <laughs> and I bet they were, too, right? Yeah, and I mean, Sister Margaret, one of the things she says is, uh, you know, she lived in the desert, like as a Carmelite, you know, in that tradition, and um, studied the desert mothers and fathers, you know, and she says, we've really misunderstood them. She said, they weren't going to the desert to escape society, but to build a new one, a new world in the shell of the old one. And she said, uh, uh, and I began to realize that the, the, uh, the city is a contemporary desert. This is where many people are moving out of, but like we can find God there. We can build a new society in the shell of the old one. So she started a community called New Jerusalem uh, with a, 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 like a bunch of folks that are recovering mostly from substance addictions, a lot of them from heroin and other uh, drug addictions. And, and so it's, it, she, she, uh, she's built this little community with those monastic rhythms, but it's a recovery community of folks, many of whom used to be incarcerated or on the street. So yeah, that's, that's kind of our DNA. So um, you and I have discussed a little bit about the new little effort that we've launched called Compassionate Christianity. And um, you've written a ton of books on a variety of different dimensions of compassion. So I'd really love for, for you to share some of that. Um, maybe could you give us an overview, you know, for the audience who aren't, aren't necessarily familiar with all of your work. And then if you want to dive down into some of those specifically, that would be wonderful. Well, that, that's sweet of you. Yeah, I mean, I, I you know, I, this is what I realized is that, um, some uh, some years ago, there was a survey that you may have seen. Some of some of the folks viewing may have seen, um, which was um, uh, the Barna Research Group. They went around the country asking young non Christians, uh, "What do you think of when you hear the word Christian? You know, what are your yes. perceptions of Christians?" And this, they went to every state in the U.S. and um, the number one answer of what these young non Christians said when they heard the word Christian was anti gay, anti homosexual. Number two was judgmental and number three was hypocritical wow and the rest of the list doesn't get a lot better you know uh, wow. pr prudish out of touch you know all these different things and what also like struck me as i read this list um is what people didn't say um and what didn't even register on the barna poll was the thing jesus said that they will know you are mine by which is love uh, people didn't say the fruit of the spirit, you know, the kindness, gentleness, goodness. So those weren't the things that came to people's mind. And so, I, I mean, I think we've got a, a major crisis, you know, when, when it comes to formation and discipleship and the fruit of our faith in the world. Um, we've often become known uh, more for what we're against than what we're for, more for who we've excluded than who we've embraced. And, and you know, I find that really uh, problematic. But um, uh, and and yet, I think the the best uh, you know the best like kind of critique uh, or corrective to what's gone wrong is to practice something better. So that's really what we've you know been after is uh, um, um, to 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 try to as Gandhi said, be the change we want to see in the world. We're trying to be the change we want to see in the church and live out a version of Christianity that. Uh, is known for love and justice and peace. Um, so, uh, yeah, we've had a lot of great mentors and teachers. You know, a lot of my books have been collaborative books that I've written with other folks too. Some of my mentors that are, uh, you know, 80 years old, like John Perkins and Tony Campolo. And uh, the prayer book we did, Common Prayer, was a collaborative book of folks across different uh, traditions and denominations of Christianity. So, um, you know, we're trying to build something that, um, you know, a generation from now when people hear the word Christian, the first thing they think of is love. That, that's sort of my dream, you know, and uh, compassion is, is you know, just another way of saying that. So, um, uh, yeah. It's concept, it's, right? I mean, thank God, yeah. you know, there are people like you 
doing this? <laughs> well, there's a lot of folks, you know, and everywhere I go, there's people are concerned about young people leaving the church. But I say, well, you know what? I I ask a lot of young people that say they've given up on Christianity. What 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 turned you off? What have you given up on? And as they describe it, I'm like, yeah, I've I've given up on that too. You know, like I. I for some people, re rejecting like Trump evangelicalism is the beginning of a of, of a more beautiful faith. Um, so I, I for for me, I think um, uh, you know as I, I think of our, even our name of what we're doing now, Red Letter Christians, comes from this secular DJ. He was actually a secular Jewish country music DJ that interviewed um, my friend, you know, our friend Jim Wallace, and he's talking to him, and he goes you know, I've read the Bible, there's parts I find confusing, and there's parts that I love, uh, and he said, but I've always liked the stuff in red, you know, he's referring to the words of Jesus, he said, you guys seem to like the stuff in red, you should call yourselves red letter Christians, and so a bunch of us, that really resonated, you know, because I think what we realize is that there's a lot of Christianity that doesn't look a lot like Jesus, and at the end of the day, Jesus is kind of the the litmus test for everything, the lens through which we interpret the Bible, the lens through which we interpret the world. And, um, you know, Gandhi was right when they asked him about Christianity. He said, I love Jesus. I just wish the Christians acted more like him. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so that's, exactly. That's what we're what a concept. So um, one of your more recent books, Beating Guns. So tell us a little bit about, you know, that and, and where you think we as a society are, is it getting better? Or is it getting worse relative to gun control and gun violence? Yeah. So, uh, I mean, here's the thing: is one of the reasons that I found myself really compelled to write this book on on guns, um, and my last book on the death penalty, is I saw that on these two issues in particular, gun violence and the death penalty, Christians have not been the champions of life. In fact, we we've, we've been quite the opposite. We've been the obstacles. Um, to to uh, for, and just to make that crystal clear, you know the the highest gun owning demographic in America uh, is Christians. We own guns at a higher rate than the general population, um, and and I know that growing up, you know I grew up in Tennessee that where God and guns kind of went together, you know. Um, but you start to see that these that the gun and the cross give us two very different versions of what power looks like. And one is willing to die and the other is willing to kill. And one is saying, love your enemies. The other is saying, stand your ground. Um, and then on the death penalty, it was very similar. 85% of executions happen in the Bible Belt. And I saw that the Bible Belt is the death belt in America, that the only way that the death penalty has survived is because of Christians. Um, and wherever Christians are more, most concentrated is where it continues to hang on. And that's really uh, troubling to me that as we, ex you know, we're, we're executing folks at the same time that we're um, proclaiming that Jesus so loved the world, he came not to condemn it, but to save it. You know, while we were yet sinners, Jesus died for us. And then, you know, so it just, these, so the, the gun violence and the death penalty surface. Uh, some really deeper issues um, with, with our theology. And it, it is about those two things, but it's also, I think, about the theology that backs those up. Um, uh, so, you know, there are narratives of how we understand Jesus's death that are kind of like God had a gun pointed at humanity and took it off of us and put the gun on Jesus and killed him. And so you can end up with some pretty violent, dangerous understandings and interpretations of, um, you know, Jesus's death and resurrection. And and so I, I think, you know, if we if we're not careful, we, we can have sort of this this toxic version of Christianity that um, ends up defending the very things that the Prince of Peace <laughs> would would kind of, I think, find appalling, you know, so. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I'm concerned about our addiction to violence and, 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 and this idea, you know, that's often called the myth of redemptive violence, that more violence is the solution to our violence, whether that's the death penalty or more guns will solve our gun problem or we need, you know, more military spending in a fragile world. Like you just end up going, I think it's kind of like an alcoholic saying, I need more whiskey for my drinking problem. You know, like, like, like love is our the solution to um, you know, hatred and violence and, and uh, 
we we don't we we we, we don't end up um, um, mirroring the very evil that we're trying to heal the world of. Like you just uh, violence is the problem, not the solution, and that's really um, what you know kind of compels me in this work uh, to end the death penalty and the gun violence. And I'm really optimistic. I think on those two issues, we're going to see some massive changes, um, you know, in our lifetime. I think just a few days ago, Colorado became the 22nd state to abolish the death penalty. Almost every year, a new state abolishes the death penalty. Only a handful of states are actively executing. And one of those is my home state of Tennessee, where we're still using the electric chair. And there's a governor that ran for office um, wearing his, you know, faith on his sleeve that he talks to Jesus every day. And yet um, he refuses to meet with the 32 men on death row that have invited him, uh, invited him over and over just to come pray with them and hear what Jesus has done with, the, with, with you know, in their lives. And I know that it would change his, um, his heart on the death penalty if he did that. Well, you know, I think um, there's hope, right? And I really like your, your optimism and your, and your thinking about how some of these major entrenched kinds of things have the potential for changing. And uh, one of the things I know I've seen change dramatically in my lifetime is the attitude toward the LGBT community. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, I'm a little bit older than you are. When, when I was young, you know, the predominance was heavily against that, you know, and everyone yeah. was in the closet virtually. Um, whereas now it's not like the entire country has changed, but certainly very high percentage of acceptance. So do you see any potential parallels in that change versus some of these other um, big issues? I do. I, I, I think, you know, there's, there's um, an incredible sensitivity to, I think, what, ha what has come to um, distinguish evangelical Christianity and one of one of those things is being anti-gay and um, having this really um, hurtful theology and these you know retreats that you can go and pray away the gay and things like that and I, I mean I can remember in my own um, a, a really definitive time for me was in college I had a young uh, one of my buddies one of my floor mates in college who told me he was gay and he grew, grew up in the church and um, had done everything. He said, I've gone on the retreats. I've had people pray over me. I've had people try to cast demons out of me. And he said, um, but at the end of the day, I'm, I, I, I'm attracted to guys. And, and I feel like all that I've learned from the church is that God made a mistake when God made me. That's what it feels like. And he just started weeping, you know. And, and like, I can remember that moment like it was yesterday and I can remember um thinking if if, if he, he, my friend can't find a home in the church then what have we become you know and, and and it really began to also something that I had talked about just as sort of a theological issue sort of became personal and I think that's really what we've got to see this is not we're good at talking about people but not talking with them and I think when we're just kind of lobbing Bible verses at each other, you know, it's, it's a dead end street. And one of the reasons I think this is difficult is because there's only like six scriptures that talk about same sex attraction. And it was a very different um, context, you know, where that was marked by abuse and exploitation. And so it's night and day from the kind of conversation around same sex, you know, lifelong covenanted equitable partnerships that we're talking about today. And yet I also believe that Jesus loving Bible loving Christians are not all going to agree on the sacrament of marriage. Um, I, I don't think we're, I think we've got to kind of realize that because then that can allow us to have a healthier conversation. Like I think that the Methodist church that I just grew up in had an epic fail on this as they excluded the affirming congregations in the denomination, you know? Um, but then I think there's other progressive circles that they're creating a line in the sand on this too. And if you, you don't have a public statement on same sex marriage, you can't speak there, you know, and they couldn't have any Catholic, even the Pope, you know, or they couldn't have a lot of folks that see the value of intersectional justice, but may not, agree on the sacrament of marriage now but I think in light of that there's some things that we need to be able to unapologetically 
passionately proclaim at the top of our lungs. And those are things like every single person is made in the image of God. And we can be specific about that. You know, every LGBTQ plus person is a child of God, made in the image of God, has unbelievable value and needs to be able to find a loving home in the church. Um, we also, I think all of us, even if we don't agree on the sacrament of marriage, need to be able to champion LGBTQ rights. Because even if, you know, we have different views on marriage, like surely we can agree that the government's job is to keep people from being discriminated against and victims of, of bigotry and hate crimes. And so we need to be champions and advocates for LGBTQ rights. So I, I hope that narrative is changing in the church. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, we, it, it's beautiful to see projects like yours, I think, that are bringing a fairly diverse group of people together that, you know, may not see eye to eye on everything, but we can sure, uh, you know, agree on love and compassion and changing the narrative of how we've navigated this issue. Um, because, you know, when we, when we end up losing our focus on Jesus, I think we talk about things Jesus didn't talk about, and we don't talk about the things Jesus um, exactly. talked a whole lot about. Exactly. And we're in trouble when we do that. And it's like, I know for me personally, it's like, I don't know if there's anybody on the planet who I agree 100% with every little detail you know, whether it's religion or politics, you know, it's like you have to be able to accept the diversity of opinion on things. Yeah, yeah. But it, you know, we, we do need to be able to say some of those things, though. Like, uh, it, you know, I, I'm not sure that you can be a, um, a you call ourselves Christians and, and not say that we're loving and affirming, you know, of the image of God and the dignity of every human being. I'm, I just don't think you can do that. You know, I, so I, I think we've got to have some starting point. And some of this has been confused by the cultural war, too, because I think we end up sometimes having the cultural conversation around sex and sexual identity um, kind of uh, override the conversation about uh, love and belonging. And, you know, my Catholic mentors have taught me that you can have a life of chastity and go without sex and experience love in a really deep and meaningful way. And plenty of my other friends have taught me you can have a whole lot of sex and not feel love at all. So I think the deeper conversation is, is not just about sex, but, but really is about love um, and, and about how we can create communities that are both supportive of, of uh, single folks and, um, and folks that are, are married and, and even communities that will disagree on, you know, how we define marriage. I think there's, there's some tensions that we can hold in that. And a lot of that, you know, I leave up to pastoral friends of mine that are walking through people, you know, as they make lifelong covenants to each other. And, you know, they're not going to affirm every heterosexual marriage, <laughs> much less every marriage. So, yeah. So, Shane, one of the books that you wrote is called Jesus for President. And so since we are in an election year, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, well, so it was around one of the other elections. I can't even remember. I think it was 20, 2012 maybe that we were, we were you know, trying to figure out what is, um, what is a faithful political uh, positioning or kind of about political imagination and how do we hope in the election year? And so we started doing these book studies and Bible studies and um, I, I am convinced that part of what the early Christians uh, uh, found was a new political imagination, that when they were saying Jesus is Lord, they were, they were also saying Caesar is not. And so I think, you know, our Jesus for President project was, was really about what does it look like to have Jesus as our ultimate allegiance? and then to try to move the world towards what he called the kingdom of God, the dream of God, you know, coming on earth as it is in heaven. Um, so I, I think that, the, you know, I've, I've got these Catholic worker, anarchistic like background, you know, to me, to me. So I've got a healthy political suspicion. And, uh, and uh, you know, I, I kind of um, uh, think one of the challenges of any election year is putting our hope and something that falls short and disappoints us. And, and any person or party is going to do that. You know, I can remember when Obama was running, they had, you know, posters that said hope on it. 
And um, what what I think we we've got to declare in, in election year and in, really in any year is that that beautiful hymn that says, "My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. All other ground is sinking sand." There's a whole lot of sinking sand, you know, these days. <laughs> so. Um, you know, my hope is not in the the elephants of the uh, elephant of the GOP or the donkey of the Democrats, but in the Lamb of God. And it's it's a lot of these things are 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 um, uh, we we've got to kind of transcend just the left and right and go deeper and think about like how do we um, set our eyes on the people that Jesus talks so much about, and particularly. You know, what does it look like to vote for the poor, to vote for the immigrant and refugee, for those who are incarcerated, for those who are homeless, for those who are without health care? And I think that um, that's really where our, our imagination needs to be as we, um, uh, you know, navigate this tricky year. Um, I mean, this is a particularly tricky one because I'm not partisan. I've never, you know, been affiliated with the Democrat or Republican Party. Uh, I don't uh, endorse candidates. I kind of feel like I've I endorse the values that I see at the heart of the gospel, and um, but it, it always makes me a little bit of a political, uh, you know, refugee on on the parties. Um, but uh, one of the framing ways that I think of some of these things um, are, is around a consistent ethic of life, and that's been really helpful for a lot of Catholic friends, Anabaptists, others are really. Um, this idea that there's a seamless garment that every person is made in the image of God, and um, and and yet, like we so narrowly defined what it means to be pro-life to the issue of abortion for many folks. That the irony is, you can be pro-guns, pro-death penalty, pro-military, uh, and still say you're pro-life. <laughs> so we would be more accurate in saying like we're anti-abortion or we're pro-birth. You know, it's a lot of times what we mean. But but to be pro-life from womb to tomb. What does that look like? And for me, that means I want to reduce abortions. I, I and I also care about uh, folks that that don't have adequate health care, and that's a big part of abortion. I, I care about, um, to me, the death penalty is a pro-life issue. A hundred lives lost every day to guns is a life issue. Um, militarism and the environmental crisis is a life issue. So I think we need a more robust uh, ethic of life that's kind of driving us. Um, and neither of the parties, I think, capture that very well. You kind of end up having obstacles if you have a consistent life ethic that um, you, you see in, in, in the different candidates. I mean, even in the last election, Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump were both for the death penalty. You know, and I was doing a lot around that at the time and was very kind of discouraged with that. I mean, you know, Donald Trump's kind of a... a yeah, it's just a train wreck on the life ethic in general. But I think that neither party has done that very well, you know. And so, um, so I, I think there's something beautiful about being um, uh, politically peculiar, you know, and and having our hope that just sort of outside of uh, the 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 parties or the the candidates. And 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 yet, I, I kind of think of voting. A better posture for us is uh, we're not looking for a political savior. We found our savior, but we're we're like looking to do damage control, you know. <laughs> so that's, that's a good way to think of it. For the person that's going to do the least amount of damage and have the least amount of collateral damage in the world, that's maybe a, a more realistic way of thinking about voting. And well, that's off. Things like like the gubernatorial races, like a governor actually can end the death penalty, um, or at least end executions, like in Pennsylvania. Our governor doesn't want to execute people, so we have a governor-imposed moratorium. So I have seen that there, there are district attorney races and others that that the person who's in there can actually make some really concrete changes. And I used to be, a, you know, quite a bit of a skeptic on how much change you could make. So I think depending on the situation, um, voting is one way that we can, um, you know, make change happen. But I, I certainly think that we also need to realize that we can vote comes from the same root as voice and we can use our voice and our power uh, in a whole lot of ways. And so we shouldn't, we dare not confine it to one day every four years or two years to a voting booth. Like immigration is so like, it's a thread all through scripture. When we welcome the foreigner, we are welcoming Christ. When we, you know, take care of the, 
the the stranger where we might be entertaining angels unaware so we've really got to do better and some of this is about fear and and having to choose between love and fear and i think that's one of the real choices we're faced with at this crossroads in america is what does america look like when it's driven by fear and what could it look like uh, for america to be driven in our policies to be compelled by love rather than fear well, Shane, this has really been a wonderful conversation. I appreciate you taking the time so so much to uh, to do this, and uh, I know our audience will be blessed by your thoughts on. Absolutely, man! It's an honor to talk, and we'll just keep the conversation going. Thanks, everybody, for listening. That's thank you, Shane.